So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mark. Mark, you may commence your presentation. Fantastic, and thank you for that introduction. Um, so, good evening, everybody. And as said, I'm Mark Burst, and I'm Vice President Technical at Power Excel. So I, as I said, I joined PowerXL in December 2019 after 17 years at the MHRA and, uh, and, and New Day's already talked about the roles I held there. Additionally, I also, prior to joining the MHRA, I worked at GSK for 10 years in a number of roles looking after technology transfer, supplier audits and the final role I had there was in R&D QA. So if we go through what I'm planning to talk to you about today. So I'm going to try and give you a bit of a background around regulatory risk-based inspections and starting with a historical look to see why they developed over time, looking at those systems that are there and what drove change and why they adapted over time to, to where they are today. Then consider what are the current risk-based approaches that are typically being used by regulators then move on to look at how regulators work together in regulatory cooperation. So looking at recognition versus reliance to see how those two differ and what the systems are there. Look at mutual recognition agreements and how they function and also how, for example, the white listing type work is, is done in the listing for APIs. Also look at the work of PICS and the role that that plays in harmonization globally for inspectorates. Also then take a little bit of a look at what, what's the possible future for regulation and where are drivers, particularly from outside of pharmaceuticals, but globally, what are the drivers for more agile regulation and why are regulators starting to think in different ways about how they do things? We're then going to move on to the topic of desktop inspections because particularly with COVID-19 and where we are now, that's been a significant change and you can clearly see for example, with conferences, they're being done remotely and just as now desktop audits are being done remotely as well. And then finally, I've just put some slides in there for some recent gathered inspection trends on, on the latest data that's out there, just to give something as, as a flavour at the end for us to discuss on those points. So let's start with um, looking at the historical reasons for um, risk-based inspections. Now, this data here and the, and, and the approach is taken, I'm going to talk about the ones that were taken at MHRA, but typically I think within that space at these times, MHRA was probably pushing more in a risk-based approach to many other agencies, so I think it's quite good to talk about these ones. So when I first joined the agency back in 2002, typically the way that risk-based inspections were done was very much based on looking at what was the duration of the site that was relevant to what the activities were being done. So it was looking at the activities versus the size and then that would, would just be in this simple table here to give you how many days you would spend on site. And the way that site size was determined was how many staff there were who were working in activities that are related to either directly GMP or the operation of the facility. So that would include all of your staff in quality, manufacturing, in the laboratories, cleaners for the facility, for example. But what it wouldn't include was that if at the site you had a finance function, those numbers wouldn't be pulled into that equation. And then they would, the sites were defined typically as less than 10 staff, 10 to 59, 60 to 249 and 250 and above. And from experience, most of the facilities when I've been to India inspecting, and that's probably well over 20 times probably inspecting in India and probably 30 times visiting India in total, most of the sites fitted into that super size, some potentially the large size. Then, then there's this section here that's on the, on the right hand side where you're coming down and it's the different types of sites that were seen. Now, if we were to take a standard type of non-sterile site, a licensed non-sterile site, it's saying for a small site, two days, for a medium site, three days, a large site, four days, and a super site would have been five days inspection. And then for sterile facilities, you can see the smaller sites were two and a half, ranging up to 10 man days of inspection for the larger sites. Now, those 
those were the frequencies determined and typically there would be two inspectors particularly on those overseas facilities so a 10-day inspection would typically be two inspectors for five days and that was what drove the process initially for how do you assess how long to spend on a site based on the risk it's inherent with that site then you had to determine what the reinspection frequency was and that was based on a very loose risk rating before 2009 it was really just determined by the inspector and it was very much in saying do we go back on a normal frequency or do we go back on an increased frequency typically any new site so that the, if it was a new site that had, had its very first inspection they would expect to be reinspected within 12 months and that was more typically within the UK but increasingly that was being pushed on sites that were overseas for an HRA as well and those sites where any critical findings were identified they would typically be put on a six month cycle possibly less but the target was to try and get back in six months to see what those inspection findings were and how they'd been corrected so the inspection there was based particular focus determined by the inspector as well on their preparation so in terms of that assessment of risk it would be for example things like the site master file what are the inspection reports say and the findings from the last inspection but also were there any information that was the inspector had wrote in the report purely for the inspector doing the next inspection to go back and look at so as always the inspector reviews and assesses the risk during their on site so whilst there may be a plan to do that inspection anything that they come across and findings or issues that are identified during the inspection that could change the, the course of and direction of the inspection and change the focus on site and that was always based on risk as well already talked about the fact that those sites that were had critical findings would have a six-month follow-up but what they would do is those issues would be reported to the inspection action group which then pulled staff from other parts of the agency not just the inspectorate to make a decision as to what action needed to be taken of any sites that had a critical finding and as we talked about new sites typically 12 months and that was really because many new sites that were seen had only just started functioning they may have made some validation batches they may not have commercialized any product yet so the, the snapshot in time that was being seen wasn't given a full indication of how that site would operate once it was fully functioning so the 12 month cycle was really to come back at a point so that the facility could be seen operating and in action so there were some drivers for change that were building prior to the prior to 2009 as well and around how regulators generally were being looked at and also how risk-based approaches to inspections were being done so back in 2004 in the UK um, Sir Philip Hampton he was asked to consider the scope for promoting more efficient approaches to regulatory inspections and enforcement but while still continuing to deliver excellent regulatory outcomes so he looked not just at pharmaceuticals this was across all government agencies in the UK to consider those that had a regulatory inspection capacity and enforcement and to see how they could do things differently so in 2005 the Hampton report was published and it said there were still problems with regulatory burden and companies having too much regulation it identified as well that there was this, this was a high cost in terms of time and money to do inspections and enforcement activities and also the use of risk assessment by government regulators was inconsistent so the Hampton report came up with the Hampton principles which were really recommendations for agencies to take forward now these principles started to develop and really so the foot then they said that regulators should use risk assessments to optimize their resources regulators should provide authoritative accessible advice and that needs to be easy and cheap for companies to get that advice it was saying no inspection should take place without a reason so there are statutory requirements which actually within the medicine space certainly within in the EU there are statutory requirements to do those inspections because they issue a GMP certificate that needs to be taken forward so that was part but it was still if a GMP certificate has a shelf a shelf life of say three years any inspections done 
interim in that period, there had to be a reason for doing those inspections. It determined that businesses shouldn't have to give information more than once to any agency, so they shouldn't be repeatedly asked for the same information. It also identified that those businesses that were non-compliant and break regulations, there's a need to identify those quicker and they need to face proportionate and meaningful sanctions, so action does need to be taken against those firms. And it was also that regulators should be accountable for the efficiency and the effectiveness of their activities. So looking at the management programs at agencies that sat over those inspectorates to determine, are they getting the best use of their resources and are they offering it in an efficient way for the taxpayer? So shortly after that period of time, there was in 2010, and this was just after the financial crash, there was a, a coalition government within the UK and they published um, a number of reports to see how could UK business be driven forward, particularly at how regulation was being done. So th they published a, a guide called the Coalition, Our Programme for Government. And within the business section, and this was how to drive business growth forward after the, the economic crisis, it was looking for these three big things. So one was around cutting red tape and they were looking for any regulation to have a one in one out rule. So you could not bring a new piece of regulation in without dispensing of a other piece of regulation and one that perhaps wasn't being used particularly. But in the particular thing of focus was this determination to end the culture of tick box regulation and have a targeted inspections on high risk organisations. So it was looking for how do, and this this is back to those previous points as well, as to say no regulation, sorry, no inspection should take place without a reason. So it was looking for there to be targeted inspections for real reasons and not just going through the motions. They were really there to determine is a site compliant or non-compliant and starting to bring risk assessments into that. The, the other aspect that was very relevant, I think, for medicines was about imposing sunset clauses on regulations and regulators. And so needing to review all the regulations they have. And if those regulations, there's no need for them anymore, then they, would, they, they, they should expire and fall away. So bringing all of those aspects together, so the, the, the drivers from the Hampton report and then the, and then the drive for change with the coalition government, the MHRA at that point, we then launched a risk-based inspection programme and that was in April 2009. So the key changes from what was that previous system were that a new compliance report was to be completed by sites prior to the inspection and returned to the inspector. And this had a number of questions that could really allow the inspector to determine what they would be doing on that site. And then after the inspection, there was a risk rating that was completed and that was pulled together to say, what would the reinspection be? Now that was partially determined on the number of findings that were made, but it was also determined by um, in other, other influencing factors that may be relevant that could drive a need to go back sooner or perhaps go back later than what the, the standard algorithm was saying. Sites will also be given the full inspection report. So that was um, those subjected to risk-based inspections would not only get the full report, they would get their risk ratings so that they could understand those activities as well and to see why their reinspection target was being driven as it was. Sites also then had to start to provide interim updates of any changes made between inspections so that if for example, the reinspection frequency was set at two years for a site, but a site had a significant change. Now that could be a good change or it could be something that that's needs to be looked at, but it would allow a dynamic assessment to be made. Is the, is the reinspection frequency that's there still relevant or should the inspection come forward or be pushed out? And that interim update also is used with other live intelligence that was assessed so what would happen was that things, for example, recalls, you know, complaints, um, maybe even mergers, acquisitions, news articles, all of those things would be intelligence that the inspectors could pull in to make an assessment of when that next inspection would be. And any site that was determined that it needed a reinspection frequency of less than two years, 
also then had to have a peer review. So that had to go for management approval to say, yes, that in site, we, we, we agree that that site should be inspected at perhaps one year frequency rather than a two year standard cycle. So the system did maintain many of the things that were there from the previous system. So it still maintained the bits we talked about earlier around the size of the site, the type of license and activities that were being undertaken. It still had a fairly standard approach that the, the inspector would determine what areas of focus they would be doing during that inspection. And also, as before, they would determine that the, how that inspection would unfold. And as they find activities, they would pivot to make their inspection focus on the things of risk that they found. There were still inspection findings of significant issues going to inspection action group. Generally, they would then have a follow up of around a six month timeline. And then typically new sites were followed up within 12 months to inspect again in action. So some of the things that were later introduced, there was the there was a creation of a central data repository that stored information. So all of the information from all of the inspections, all of the findings, all of license variations, complaints, recalls, all of those things would be put into one system. And on top of that system, there was a statistical algorithm that was designed that would determine what the risk of a site was and would be able to say on, on, on a regularly run report, has the risk of that site, has it either, has it either moved out and it's less risky as a site or has it moved in? And it had lots of weighting to those factors that would determine what changes needed to be. So some things were more important than others. But also there was a factor of time built into there. So as time progressed away from perhaps that point where there may have been a, a recall by the company, that became less significant over time. So all of those factors would come together to give a, a report for the inspectors to look at. Now that worked for a period of time, but I think o o overall the benefits that it was gaining weren't as much as the, the, the key thing was the central repository for allowing inspectors to do that. So it was more challenging to run them first envisaged and the use was scaled back from it and perhaps making automatic decisions. And then subsequently, one of the other changes that's come about was where there was critical non-findings that would be put to the inspection action group. There was a determination to see how could findings that sites where their compliance was starting to deteriorate. So those sites where they may still be operating in a marginally acceptable manner, but over time there is a trend towards more, <clears throat> more inspection findings or less compliance at the site, but not to the point that they're getting critical findings. So within the inspectorate there was an established something called the compliance management team where it would take findings and sites that were in that borderline category, but hadn't yet tipped over into a, into a situation where they were non-compliant. And it was a way of trying to manage those sites more closely, put more focus with them, but also the ability to talk to senior managers within those organizations to point out to them that their site was starting to fail with the opportunity to present to them that actually it's not too late to make changes. You can start to develop things on the site now. And here's examples of sites where they have failed and, and it's been very detrimental to their business. And as a consequence, it helped companies to improve, which was very good obviously in, in, in determining patient safety. But what it also meant was that whilst there was some extra work for, for the agency to do for the inspectors, because there now was another process to do with compliance management team, not full non-compliance and critical findings is a huge amount of work for the, for the agency and the inspector. So this middle ground meant there was a bit more work, but actually overall more sites managed to improve as a consequence of that, and the number of sites becoming fully non-compliant and needing regulatory action had, had decreased. So overall, that was a benefit and a help with taking those things forward. So, <coughs> so if we look at perhaps PICS risk-based inspections, 
and this is then largely used by many um, many agencies globally. So this recommendation was first published back in 2012 and it's heavily based on the MHRA system in terms of how it's established for the for the risk-based inspection program. But part of the stuff it does do, it brings an additional process which determines here and it's around the complexity of the site and the intrinsic risk associated purely with the site. So it takes the complexity of the site process and then the criticality of the products that are there and that determines this criticality index and gives a score which is then combined and gives a score of low, medium or high. Now those compliance risks then are taken depending on how many findings there are. So determining on, are there no major or critical findings between one and five critical findings and, and one or more here of um, critical deficiencies. With all of those aspects coming together, it's a combination of what's the compliance risk versus the intrinsic risk, which then gives a score, which determines the inspection refrequency. So those that sit in the lower category are between two to three years, those in the moderate findings are one to two years, and those in the increased risk category are less than one year for inspections. Now that's that aspect, as I say, sits above and beyond where the the, the system that MHRA were using. And I think it's it's a balance, I think, because this this score here was essentially saying what's what are the activities done at the site and what's the what's the um criticality of those products and the complexity of the site and complexity is really based around what are the activities they're doing are they making non-sterile products are they making sterile products now some of the argument would come back to the gmps for making sterile products are more complex and then when you're inspecting you're inspecting against those gmps and you're assessing the compliance against those gmps that are there to control a more complex processes and that comes back to the how to determine how long to spend on site. So those activities were felt to be adequately covered within the original system. So whilst this newer process was developed within PICS and most countries are then operating this type of system, within the MHRA it was their existing mindset of the risk-based inspection program they had, the, the, the bits that carried through that still covered that in an adequate manner. So said so we would talk a little bit about future uh, regulatory models. So the World Economic Forum um, has something called the Centre for the Fourth Industrial Revolution. So this sits around where the Fourth Industrial Revolution work that's being developed through the World Economic Forum gets driven gets driven slightly more than just saying here's the growth that's coming from um, digitization it also looks to say how do regulators manage to cope in that space and do things and what they've determined is and this this, this is pretty much aligned with some of the things that were done back with some of the things in the uk with the hampton report a number of years ago but it was also looking to see these two so it's identified two clear issues so the first of those it's identified is about regulatory pacing and the second that's been identified is a problem of regulatory coordination now as i was saying this isn't about pharmaceutical um, regulation this is regulation across all sectors and all industries where there are fourth industrial revolution activities going on which obviously in pharma there certainly is with uh, lots of digitization and coming through the system. Now, what this does is that if you looked at the pacing problem, what it what it's identified is that regulation often struggles to keep pace with the emergence of new ideas, products and business models, which I think is 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 a fair reflection because it's not generally agencies and regulators that are inventing new processes or ways to do things they can help enable them and i think this is this is where it's talking about doing more but it's going to be the inventors and companies that take those things forward it also found around coordination in that regulators often struggle to respond to innovations in a joined up way so where a new process cuts across more than one regulator it was found that 
um, the regulators aren't particularly joined up in taking those things forward. So from that, the World Economic Forum have proposed seven principles of agile regulation. And these are being spoken about quite widely within regulatory circles or those types of influences that influence regulation across all sectors. And I'm sure at some point we'll start to filter down to pharmaceutical regulators as well. So those seven principles for agile regulation. So the first one is about foresight and anticipatory outcome. So it talks about horizon scanning and early engagement. And what, what I could do is perhaps in this space as well, is as, as we go through this slide, is talk about, from my experience at MHRA, whether we were doing some of these things or, or, or not. So certainly for the first one around foresight and anticipatory outcome, we, there was a lot of horizon scanning done and a lot of early engagement. So the agency had a formalized horizon scanning group that would look out to see what are the new technologies coming down? What are the new things in regulatory science that are going to influence the way that regulation has to change? And then try to talk to the right people as early as possible. And within that space as well, the agency also had its innovation office so that it can enable companies who are at the more cutting edge of change to come in to seek regulatory advice and on that advice make changes but that that process allows the agency to start to understand what are the potential changes that are coming in the future and actually start to adapt its mindset at that point as well so it talks about another the next one of the agile principles was really around outcome focused regulation so it's talking here around how do regulations become outcome focused with stretching outcomes to stimulate innovation so there's probably less scope i think within some of the pharmaceutical sector to do this but i think i think you'll find that certainly with the and now where we are with covid there's certainly regulations where well not regulations but there are spaces where regulators are working to try and help accelerate research or to help bring things to to market quicker with good still still good robust scientific advice and rigor but how can that have stretching targets and outcomes aligned with government needs to stimulate innovation in this space so next one's about experimental regulation. So how can regulators support testing and trialing of innovation? The use of regulatory sandboxes. So uh, again, this, so this was actually other regulators looked at how pharmaceuticals in general work, and they viewed that sandboxing was a bit like a, a clinical trial. So how could you set up, particularly for things like artificial intelligence, how can you set up a sandbox, run those systems, and then see how they work and within the finance sectors there's been a lot of regulatory sandboxing that's been done but to bring that back so when i was at mhra certainly within the medical device field and working with some of the other regulators that needed to be involved in some of that work there was regulatory sandboxes being set up to work with companies in a safer space for them to trial how their systems would work in in those processes Next one's around reg tech and responsive regulation. So how can how can outcomes be monitored in real time and then adapting regulations accordingly with outcome focused triggers for review? So some of this is probably less for pharmaceuticals because the, the regulations are less likely to adapt that quickly. But I think you're seeing more and more that regulators are starting to work with companies, particularly in a regulatory space on real time reviews and reviewing data when there isn't a full package there to try. And so it's not adapting the regulations, but they're trying to, within the regulations, be more agile to help companies accelerate through those processes. So the next point was around from the WF was on a coordination and self-regulation. So how can industry develop more self-regulation and take things forward and that coordination? Now, I think pharmaceuticals is probably quite a good example of this. Now, whilst it's perhaps not self-regulation, there are, for example, certainly you know, ISPE as a group will have lots and lots of working groups that are brought together to establish good standards it will release guidelines and for for companies so that whilst the regulations can be fairly broad and, and, and all-encompassing it will help 
companies to understand how to operate in that space in a compliant manner using information pulled from industry experts. So whilst it's not the regulation that's being set, it's helping navigate through those regulations. So I think that's a good example of where some good things are done there. Next one's on joined up regulation. So how's that promoted across all areas and perhaps have a primary coordinated authority? Now actually medicines is probably one of the better examples of this space. So if you take organizations such as PICS with over 50 um, regulators coming together to be much more joined up across that space, or if you're looking around, for example, the European licensing system and how that's completely set up with primary coordinated authorities as, as here and how that work then is done by some but accepted by more. So there, there's some good examples there. And then around international regulatory cooperation and unilateral adoption of guidelines, regulations and standards. So you've got groups such as ICH driving that forward in, in pharmaceuticals, and then you've got things such as MRAs that, that help drive those processes as well. So I think I think some of these, there's definitely more that can be done by regulators to learn and how to be more agile and how to support innovation and balancing that back into their risk-based approaches. But I don't think pharmaceutical regulation is in a bad place. And I think there's there's lots of good work that's ongoing as I've tried to highlight. So let's move on now to look at what is mutual recognition and reliance and, and who does what in this space and how does that work? So if we start with mutual recognition agreements, so they're agreements between two regulatory agencies and it allows them to recognize each other's regulatory assessments, inspections or reviews. So it's just fairly easy. So within the EU, MRAs allow authorities and their counterparts, so they rely on each other's GMP inspection programs, they can share information on inspections and quality defects and it gives a formal process to do that, but also it will waive batch testing of products on import into, into territories. So some countries don't require um, batch release testing on importation, but those that do, such as such as within the EU, when there's the MRA in place, it negates the need for that activity. Now, there would still be a need for a QP to certify the batch, but it's not relying, it's relying on the testing that's been done by the manufacturer, not testing that's been done on importation. But it's worth noting that every agreement has its own scope, so the scope of which products are in scope or out of scope will be different for every MRA. Now, the EU then has MOA agreements with Australia, Canada, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Switzerland and the US. Um, but slight different one with it, its agreement with Israel. It has um, something called a, a conformity assessment and acceptance of industrial products. So it's called an ACCA. Now, this MRA is much more aligned around how the infrastructure and the legislative system of that country is aligned to the EU. So if you look, Israel doesn't just operate in, in, in an equivalence with EU GMP. Israel operates actually to EU GMP and that's built into its legislative system. So as a consequence, that MRA is, whilst on the ground it doesn't make a huge difference, it does mean that it's far more aligned and, and almost an extension of the EU system with Israel. So there's also, for, for active substance importation, there's activities that are done there around listing of third countries to take those things away. So some countries are having to make for every API batch that's done, there has to be a written confirmation. And, and, and India is an example of a country that does a written confirmation with its APIs for those being sent to the EU. And that came about from the falsified medicines directive. Now, there is a requ that requirement can be waived for certain third countries that are listed by the Commission. So it's down for countries, so their, their regulator in that country will apply to the European Commission to have an equivalency assessment undertaken. Now those assessments have been done for a number of, of countries by by the EU. So there's those that are approved. So there's South Korea, the US, Japan, Brazil, Australia, Israel and Switzerland. So they've all had assessments undertaken. So I was work, I worked and 
the Brazilian assessment there, so I undertook that with the European Commission at the time. There were some ongoing assessments. There's the one of Canada that's ongoing. Uh, there's one for New Zealand. Uh, some of that's st still on scope around what's actually included within the MOA currently. And then there's the one with Singapore. And then clearly there's the discussion at the moment around, depending on the, the outcome of the Brexit negotiations, which are in their almost in their final stages for the, the UK's future working relationship with the EU, it may be necessary for the UK to have a possible application as well to be listed for API export to the EU. So for these, there is a supporting process. So in terms of how is this done, so there's the, there's the actual application, but essentially there needs to be an evaluation that's undertaken to say, can this system or you know can one country rely on another country in terms of the work that it does so this all fits into this risk-based approach of can one regulator trust another regulator with the decisions that are being made so there's an evaluation guide that's been established for gmp regulatory compliance programs and that guide is used in the mras that are decided it's used within the api whitelisting it's also used internally across the entirety of the EU. So it's called the, there it's called the Joint Audit Programme. So, and that's where on a, on a routine programme, agencies are inspected and they're inspected by other member states within the system. So, and that's to ensure the consistency of GMP standards and that harmonised approach across Europe. Now, that assessment has 78 indicators that sit across 10 subject areas. And they're, so there's, it's a combination of review being done in advance to see in, in, in the application, in, in the documents that are supplied by an agency, they're reviewed. They're also then, there's an audit undertaken of the inspector and there's also on-site inspections observed. So I've done a num number of these. So for MRAs, I did the, the the US, so did this assessment as part of auditing the US FDA. Um, it's also aligned with PICS and their joint reassessment programme. And I've been involved in leading when New Zealand joined PICS and also auditing and visa in Brazil who are coming through that process, as well as using that in MVSA for the API whitelisting. Now, the way that it works is, as I say, that there's a review done up front to look to see is the legislation within that country and the ability for them to do their regulatory function, is that operating correctly? There's then, there's then an assessment done. There's typically between a one to two week process of going to that other agency, reviewing all of their systems, um, records, documentation, how they control their GMP system, their laboratories and uh, all other activities. But there's also an, as part of an assessment where, and typically it's across two inspections, but that agency go to audit one of their manufacturers within their territory and the observers who are making the assessment under the under the joint audit program or the JRP program for PICS observe those inspectors doing their routine inspection. So it's essentially there's an inspection going on and the inspector of the site is also being inspected at the same time. So the whole process was initially developed by Health Canada as part of their initial MRA process when the, when the MRA between Canada and the EU was first pulled together. So let's take a look at some of the aspects around that JRP checklist. So it has a number of activities and I, and I won't go through all of these, but we'll just pick out a few. But really the first sections are around legislation and regulatory requirements and scope. So it's looking at what is the empowering legislation and are there conflicts of interest? So it's looking to see how are conflicts of interest between inspectors and anything else they do handled. It then looks at their regulatory directives and policies. So it looks at how inspectors are designated. Is there a code for conduct? It, how the organisational structure of that agency is pulled together for the relevant areas. Then goes into the GMP standards. So 
are they how are the GMPs um, there what are they using are they if, if they're not using exactly the same GMP how's that pulled together it then looks at the actual inspectors itself and says are the staffing numbers correct have they got an, are there enough staff how are, how are inspectors qualified how are they trained so it assesses the the ability of the agency to undertake its inspections in a robust way then goes to inspection procedures so is there a strategy how are pre-inspections how are they communicated format of inspection reports post inspection activities all of those things pulled together it then looks at the performance standards to say are there measures in place to check that the whole system operates as is and is done correctly looks then at the enforcement power so once you've moved from compliance findings and you're moving into legislative or, or, or criminal type findings how is that there for violations how do how do enforcement powers be undertaken by agencies and you know for example removing people's licenses or taking criminal action against them it then assesses the alert and crisis systems within the agency to see how robust they are and to look to see how that's coming not only how they deal with them but how are they communicated out and how are those from other agencies brought in then looks as well around the analytical capabilities typically with a, a an audit of the on-site laboratory as well to assess how testing is being done by the agency itself and then looking at its surveillance program so how does it what sample what market testing does it do does it have a recall systems and then around um, def defect reporting systems and procedures so all of those come together to help make a decision as to the compliance status of that regulator so if we move on now to PICS and so we've talked about that's the same process that's used so essentially any a, any regulator who wishes to join PICS that's the assessment process they undergo and typically that can take up to the maximum of six years which is within the system to allow that them to join but PICS is there as a process of harmonizing inspection procedures so it, it looks to develop common standards for GMP but also provide training opportunities to inspectorates and then it aims to facilitate that cooperation and networking between competent authorities and increase mutual confidence what it doesn't it doesn't have the system that if somebody is a PICS member then there's that there's a mutual acceptance in a, in a in a legalistic way of each other's inspection outcomes but it leads the international development of harmonized standards and it looks as i say to try and support that closer working across across agencies now the goals of pics are supported by a number of things so it has a number of working groups that focus on how to drive forward um parts of parts of gmp and take things forward it has a number of expert circles where it looks to develop guide guidelines but also acts as how to where needed perhaps train other agencies or bring them along that journey and more recently it's had the pix inspectorates academy established which is a web-based system for agencies to as a repository to put all of their learning activities so that agencies globally can learn from each other and create better systems and standards so there's a bit of history so PICS is coming up to its 50th anniversary very soon actually it was uh, founded actually in 95 as PICS but it was an extension at that point to the pharmaceutical inspection convention which was initially established in 1970 coming live in 1971 hence I say it's coming up to the 50th anniversary as part of the European Free Trade Association so there is still aspects of PIC which did for some of the European countries allow a complete acceptance of each other's inspections this is before the European system as you, as you would know now is but in 95 that system couldn't carry on because you started to have non European members joining and you had the European Union being established so it was at that point that PICS was founded and there was that switch to it becoming non and not an acceptance of each other's inspections but it enabled cooperation and, and, and best practice working together so 
and, and, and really then back to how the, all of those risk-based assessments now work. So what did happen was though that there was a there's now within PICS there's a GMP inspection reliance initiative. Now this is there to basically allow utilization of inspection resources to enable authorities to best use their resources either domestically or abroad on the highest risk issues they have in the highest risk inspections but it's also seen there to duplicate the number of inspections that are the same scope that are done by other regulators and i'm sure many of you listening will have had inspections done by multiple regulators at your facilities now this is a drive to try and change that so it has a regulatory decision that's needing to be made in one country but the manufacturing sites in another country but how does it how do the two countries talk to each other and how do they pass information that allows the country that's got to make a decision as to using that manufacturer do they need to do an inspection can they do a, a part inspection desktop or actually no inspection at all and although there may not be an mra in place what reliance can they place on that work to make a risk-based decision as to whether that site's okay to use now this project was initially originated from ICMA, which was one of their initial seven projects they put forward. So that that piece of work, so it allows and the way the process works is you have the requesting authority, as I was just saying, gets that information. But what it does mean is that the inspectorate that's being asked may be able to supply a GMP certificate and the GMP inspection report, which is the most important piece of information. The other bit of information that may be requested is around a company's cappers from their last inspection as well to make a decision. But what would normally happen was that the, the requesting authority, the one that sits in the, in the country wishing to make a decision, will inform both the manufacturing side and the hosting authority of the outcome of that remote inspection and to say whether they've approved them or not based on the information supplied by the regulator that's in the country where the manufacturer is. So just to give a bit of background on ICMA, so it's the International Coalition of Medicines Regulatory Authorities and that was established um, back, uh, back in the around 2012 time it first came from the uh, on the back of the fda's 100th anniversary where a number of company so a number of countries and their regulators came together and on the back of that they started to determine how could they drive forward things in a regulatory space and then it became more formalized under icma and they set up seven initial working groups now some of those were around how do they set themselves up as an organization but two of them, in particular, the GMP inspections and a look at generic medicines were saying, how can we change the way some of that regulation is being done at the moment? Now, that GMP inspection group was then led by MHRA. So I was leading that group to take forward, how do we try to develop a new process, which is the one that's now been established in PICS. So that was working with USFDA, uh, EMA, Canada, Australia, France, and and some others as well and then from that the we developed a procedure that was eventually adopted by PICS and became the procedure that I just spoke about. So that's probably a look to see where we are around how um, how risk-based inspections work, how agencies rely on each other, how the MRAs are established and how that means then that they can rely on each other's work. And then it was looking at that more informal manner as well to say, okay, within where there may not be an MRA, what are the other systems such as that, that PICS Reliance Initiative that can be used to make a better risk-based decision on what, in, what sites are going to look at? Now, the next thing I'm just gonna run through just briefly is to just have some aspects around um, this desktop GM, desktop audits because clearly there's lots going on at the moment and it, uh, we just thought um, with, with Uday and I that it may be something that may be uh, as a useful point. So to talk through, so why are they there? So clearly there's travel restrictions at the moment, massively so from COVID and as a consequence agencies aren't able to get out and do their inspections. So within the FDA they've had the power for a while ever since the Fidesia Act to have request information in lieu of an inspection and the ability to do off-site considerations 
and then one of the first things within within Europe that was done was as a consequence of not being able to get to site was an automatic extension of all GMP certificates to the end of 2021 but it's also the ability for where there are sites that have not been inspected or an inspection is required that a remote inspection may be carried out so it's certainly been used by some agencies and it's certainly good as a tool in a time of crisis but I can say that certainly many, many agencies were working on their ability to do desktop audits before this. And certainly when I was at MHRA, we'd started to establish desktop audit programs for um, certainly with wholesalers in the UK. And as a consequence of the PICS Reliance Initiative, we had started to do some desktop audits as well without going without the facility, but gathering some information from the host in the regulator. But what we're seeing is that regulators at this time are certainly using a balance of hybrid inspections as well. So some a combination of desktop and some more remote inspection activities. We're seeing as well that they're using the MRAs a lot more, but they're having to balance the safety of medicines versus the availability. But I think one of the things that I'll touch on this in the next couple of slides is if you were contacted by a health authority to do a virtual inspection, do you have a plan as to what you would be doing? because it's significantly different from a standard on-site audit or inspection that you receive. So I think it's, uh, so to see there's some wider impact as well, I think it's worth remembering that agencies are also businesses. So many of those have had to shut their offices, They've, they're home working as well. So some of the workloads of those agencies have perhaps also slowed down. And as a consequence, it may be harder to actually have communication with them or to see where um, any applications that are in by companies are progressing at this time, particularly if they're being determined that an inspection is needed to take that application forward. Also, I think if companies are starting to change supply models because of disruption, is there the regulatory capacity to start to respond to new facilities being built that may be there to take forward those activities or those activities in a different way to be more robust in the future? So how are regulators sharing those inspection outcomes? Well, really, it comes back to what we were talking about earlier. So it's the formal recognition processes that we've discussed. It's those less formal reliance initiatives, like the PICS one. But what are they doing with this information? And, and often it is actually no more than a tick box. And there is trust in the system, particularly with MRAs. Uh, so in, in, from a European point of view, the well-established MRAs, for example, with Australia, when I was at the agency, we were never asked to make assessments of those of those co uh, companies in Australia. It was accepted that the MRA was in place and they would be working to an equivalent GMP. There's the ability to use, for example, databases such as UTRA GMDP to see what inspection outcomes are. And also it's, it's the ability to take forward cases of non-compliance because that's a lot harder within this COVID time because if you've had serious non-compliance a non-site inspection is going to give you more than a remote one but you need to balance that against supply patient safety and patient availability for those medicines so it's it's a lot harder and I think within things like the the MRA it's a lot newer process for FDA and they need to establish how they work in that scope and how much decision making process they can rely on the outcomes that are being supplied from an MRA partner. So what have we observed so far? So this is we've been working and talking to. Um, so I work with a number of colleagues who are ex FDA or ex other regulators globally, and we've been talking to um, the, the, the regulators that we came from. And generally, we've observed that, as I said, that may, most of those regulators have postponed their inspections at the moment as a consequence. We've seen some do documentation and data requests being made, particularly by FDA, with a quick turnaround time for responses. We've seen much more reliance on things like MRA outcomes and desktop remote inspections between regulators talking about stuff. We've seen that domestic inspections occur based on risk and they're far easier to conduct at this time when perhaps overseas travel is very difficult. We started to see agencies using more technology around cameras, videos and data sharing in order to 
make their inspection programs work. So what, what's been observed so far from an industry point of view, well, we've started seeing some companies, um, clearly there's a need for all companies to protect their staff, protect their operations and protect patient supply at this time. But we've seen that leading to increased operational pressures on site at some facilities and also a reduction in potentially in the level of quality oversight because there are less staff on site and it's more home working. And on some facilities, we started to see an increase in the number of deviations and potential data integrity issues that are there. And we've also desperately seen the companies being unprepared for remote inspections. And I think it's remembering that regulators will return and at this time GMP and data integrity are not optional. And I think when regulators do return to your facilities, the first thing they're going to ask is what happened at your facility concerning quality during COVID-19? And then it's going to be your ability to demonstrate control when you're asked about this. So how are you able to demonstrate that you've changed control and you've managed all of the changes you've made? Have you made changes because of COVID-19 in an, an open and dynamic change control? Or have you had lots of one-off change controls that have been um, opened and closed? But it's considering what is the overall cumulative impact of those changes and how can you demonstrate control still? deviations have you had more have you had less now there could be reasons for both it could be you've to do with more deviations but have you had less staff and ability to report them has your regulator given you any regulatory flexibilities have you used them and i think keeping a log of those is important but also how have you maintained control and quality just of everything you've been doing and particularly for data integrity how can you confirm that you still have control of, of the things done at the site? And we were talking earlier that you're saying that there's fewer staff on site. How have you defined the core roles? How have you defined access to documents and all of those activities that need to be built into that? And on top of that, you've got staff that are potentially anxious and you've got pressures to maintain supply. So there's a bit of a perfect storm there. So how are all of these things, how are you controlling them within your facility? So I think a future operational state, really, I think we will see regulators not, I, I don't think there's going to be a, a, a complete V-shaped traje trajectory going back to past practices of what was happening. But certainly talking to regulators, there's an, env an envisagement that this will go on for quite a long time. And actually some of the things that have been done during this period are probably good practice to take forward in, in new inspections in the future, particularly around the ability to do more, more hybrid type inspections. How much documentation can be reviewed remotely before an inspection even takes place and is conducted? And could you then reduce the amount of site you spend, amount of time you spend on site at a facility because of the amount of processes you've done beforehand? I think it'll be more around global harmonization and driving that forward so an even greater reliance on some of the things we've talked about earlier and the risk-based approaches that come with uh, MRAs and reliance initiatives and I think as well is, is there opportunities potentially for more partner partnerships out there is there a need perhaps to start to consider the way that device inspections and processes are done, particularly where it's not the agencies doing that and it's trusted partners doing essentially that work. Is there a, is there a change time for a mindset change within some of this? And that would be a little bit more like some of the excipient GMP model as well that's used. So I think that I think the whole COVID situation will fundamentally make regulators assess how they're doing those audits and take things forward in a potentially slightly different way. So in terms of how to think about those regulatory or site compliance assessments and how regulators are doing them, but this, this is just talking about this is how within the organisation that I work we've started to develop and we've been doing lots of um, desktop assessments. Um, I've conducted a few in India in, in recent weeks and they're pretty successful. They seem to be working quite well. But it's a five, five point assessment process that we've been using, assessing the operations to determine the needs, undertaking that desktop review of the products and the pipeline that are, that are there, and then 
initiating that using video conferencing and interviews to drive forward that process and in a very then standard way having a standard delivery that are a GMP gap, gap analysis and a, and a report at the end that highlights where improvements need to be made at the site and if that then comes back to a need for regulatory dialogue then supporting clients to have that regulatory dialogue afterwards and then this is and this is pretty similar to any anything that a regulator will do but then we had a process that's been established on a six system evaluation looking at the quality systems that are there and as detailed you know through through fda is their six system evaluation process having an assessment to look as i say at the pipeline strategy all of those things across aseptic biotech non-sterile manufacturing but any of those to have the right skill set and the modules to bring all of those people together and then assessing the regulatory requirements that are there for the site so bringing all of those together into a desktop assessment of the site to give a meaningful snapshot of the activities that are happening at that time so just finally and, I, and i'll go through this pretty quick because still to allow time for questions um, just to look at some of the compliance trends that are there over the last couple of years so really some of the things that are that are driving forward so there's we and it's been the big focus obviously of this talk but is around global harmonization and reliance and all of the activities that are going on there for regulators there's still a big drive around quality culture and quality maturity and how they can really how, how can you really make an assessment of the maturity of the quality of the site and still a lot of activities going on in that space there's certainly the the fourth industrial revolution bits that are there but and pharma 4.0 that clearly ispe are leading on so i've talked a bit about the agile regulation that comes out from the world economic forum for the fourth industrial revolution but i've got a couple of slides that talk about this more from a pharmaceutical point of view in a moment and then I think the other trends and compliance things at the moment really are around complex processes and the GMP expectations around those. So the, the development of the ATMP work and PICS are certainly still working within how they develop that guidance based on the changes that were made within the European GMPs in that space. How does advanced manufacturing analytical approaches come forward? So continuous manufacturing, 3D printing, all of these things still need development to more but also how do agencies facilitate innovation so I gave some examples that sat within that agile regulation space as recommendations but I think there are some agencies doing it some not doing anything but also how can that be improved because I think more partnerships that drive innovation forward are absolutely key particularly at this time where we've you know we're, we're in a health crisis and we're looking to see how do we accelerate treatments for patients so you can clearly see that at this time it's it's really showing the need for that partnership with modern innovation so just a couple of bits to talk then about pharma 4.0 and, and the world economic forum work so within the wef they've got a, a global lighthouse network with mckinsey that back in 2018 they assessed the thousand production facilities now this is across all sectors of manufacturing and 16 companies were recommended as well, recognized as leaders for fourth industrial revolution then in uh 2019 another 28 sites were added to that list so there are currently 42 sites within that lighthouse network and the example that i've picked out here was really one that's a this is this is a pharmaceutical company this one is actually in the uk but through the use of um, advanced analytics neural networks being used on their data sets and the types of the types of ability to use technology in this space some of the key things I mean they've managed to drive up their uh, machine performance by 10 percent on operational effectiveness their artificial intelligence guided throughputs giving them a 21 percent increase in throughput and their cycle time as a good example has managed to drop by nine percent so you can see that the benefits for this are huge if you're if you're running a, a fairly near capacity the ability to give this from your existing facility versus having to increase capacity from a new facility is huge for organizations 
Um, so to come back to, to ISPE and what they're doing, so ISPE has a special interest group for Pharma 4.0. It's certainly leading this way and this space for, uh, for pharmaceuticals. So it's looking here at, at a top level really around how it all comes together with digital maturity, data integrity by design, but then reviewing are the resources right within this space, the information systems needed, the culture that's required and the organization and processes. So I think if this is something you're interested in, I would definitely recommend going onto the ISPE website, have a look at some of the information that's there. There's, there's plenty of really good articles on there around stuff that's being taken forward in this space. And to bring it back to some of this um, holistic control strategy work and how it would all come together. So it's how does ICHQ10 blend with the Pharma 4.0 aspects. So you've got you've got the PQS elements, but what are the new PQS elements required to really support Pharma 4.0 and take things forward? And bringing through the enablers around this digital maturity and data integrity by design to really make sure that this is embedded within pharmaceutical manufacturing, but also that regulators can come along on this journey, get it so that the but so that as a partnership, patients are better served through this. Now, what are some of the things that we've seen? Um, so certainly from what I've seen at facilities, I've seen augmented reality being used. So operator interfaces, smart glasses, iPads that will bring up um, visualization overlays on equipment to help drive things forward and know what's the next process to do. The use of virtual reality, so use it for training, so we're able to train operators offline or partnering with suppliers so that if you buy a new piece of equipment, you can get the virtual reality overlay at the same time, plug that into your system and you can start to train operators or see how the system works before you've even received the piece of kit. Use of artificial intelligence and machine learning particularly around predictive quality, so being able to make decisions as to where there are variables within the system and give a predictive quality outcome of a batch to support things. And digital twinning as well to drive forward processes by able to establish what would be the changes in an offline manner. The use of blockchain to, to improve supply chain management and documentation control, I think is a, a key thing. Seeing more connected facilities that are using the Internet of Things and connected systems. I've been to a facility where they have no paper, um, all the systems, all every system's on the same um, databases. It won't allow operators to use equipment if it's out of validation, it's not been calibrated. For example, when they take samples off the line, they label those samples with an RFID label. The second that the second that sample comes into the laboratory door, it's registered onto the limb system immediately and then the limb system controls all everything again no no laboratory equipment can be used if it's not in the right manner to be using it through all through that connectivity that's in the system and then how can knowledge management throughout the life cycle be maintained so stopping that data loss and ensuring that all the knowledge from r d through to manufacturing isn't lost at that time now, just in the last five minutes, very, very at the top level, and you'll you'll get these slides afterwards, and I hope they're useful. And if you've any questions on these aspects when you've when you've read them through, then then come back to me afterwards because I do want to leave some time for questions. So, bits on some global inspection trends. So, the first of these really was just the FDA trends from 2016 to 2019, and clearly you can see here that the joint top there are around the quality of investigations that are being undertaken and issues being identified with data integrity. Then going through contamination, laboratory controls, validation and procedures. And then for devices, it was around, number one thing was around their corrective and preventative actions. Again, investigations as a common topic, data integrity, validation, so that you can see there's very little difference between what's being found on the drugs and biologics side as is being found on the devices side for FDA. So MHRA last published their data in 2018, and here you can see that majority of the findings, like 24% of the contribution came from issues around the pharmaceutical quality system, 
but then it goes through in documentation, production, qualification, validation, and, and, and so forward. But to, to look at those in a little bit more detail, so the pharmaceutical quality system findings really sat around, again, investigations, absolutely the same as FDA were finding, root cause analysis, cappers, again, exactly the same stuff. Use of quality risk management principles, change management, etc. Documentation mainly around traceability, use, some of that traceability could be data integrity and completion could be data integrity. So again, fairly well aligned with what FDA were finding too. Certainly then findings around sterile processing and, and, and Annex 1, so a failure to ensure sterility assurance, media fuel processes, microbial contamination and issues. And then a, a number of findings as well in production around materials management, supplier qualification and competence of staff in production. Quick look here at TGA's data and, and, in, and in fairness you can see that the majority of the sites are being found as good or satisfactory in the blue and the orange categories. There's a few that are found in the basic but actually they had nothing that was found unacceptable in that financial year 18 to 19 which is a positive. And that was their uh, ratings there. Then they have their major findings that they've had from overseas inspections. And again, it's not that dissimilar. You can see that the, the, the one of the bigger chunks of the pie there is the pharmaceutical quality system, documentation at chapter four, which is the purple one at the bottom. Um, so you can see really that the bigger chunks there are exactly the same as what other regulators were finding, which again shows a pretty much harmonization in the way that inspectorates are working. Then with the GMP annexes, the, the, the two big ones are 11, computerized systems, which probably again lends itself to issues around data integrity, and 15 on qualification and validation, which again was a big topic for the other regulators as highlighted. Just a couple of bits as well, just here on, on China and WHO. So China had issues that they were mainly identifying from this is their 2017 data around uh, analytical units being inadequate, data integrity, documentation control, and, and, and quality systems, quality management. So again, aligned WHO's last data from 2018, data integrity, maintaining quality and compliance culture, and differing quality standards and expectations with sites. So all of them, I think, I think it shows that you're coming back to that whole point of how do you rely on other agencies and how do you rely in a risk-based manner. I think this is important, this, these data at the end, because this is showing that fundamentally the big topics for the agencies are the same for all of them. Hence, that really does underpin their ability to rely on each other and take things forward. And I still think there's, there's a lot to be done in this space and regulators will increasingly work more and more with each other. So finally, just the data integrity, there is a lot of global guidance out there. I won't go through these, but when, when, you, when you do get the slides, it's worth a look, I think, because um, it's it, it, there's an increasing number of documents being put out and WHO recently putting some more documents out. But again, they are very well aligned between all of these pieces of work and fundamentally fit that they, they have the same goal in mind. So once again, I think it's demonstrating that global reliance that can happen between regulators. So I've gone on a bit longer than I in the in the time. So we've still got 15 minutes. So um, happy to take some questions. And if you do have points afterwards, you can always email me as well. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. <clears throat> Let us take the questions. Uh, so there is a question about uh, the procedure of risk evaluation from central data repository for inspector. Is it some software or how is this being done, the risk rating and the risk evaluation? Yeah, so the, so the, the risk ratings come back to, let me just let me go back to slide, hang on. So, so the risk ratings essentially are based here on the ability for the number of findings that are made by the site. So it's, it's a determination 
here. So it's, it's, it's this bit here. So the compliance risk comes from the number of findings that are made. So a low risk site has no major and no critical findings. So this is the PICS process, but this is fairly well aligned with, with, with most agencies. Then, so this is determined after the inspection. So then the medium risk has one to five major deficiencies. So if it has, and then the high risk has one or more critical deficiencies or more than five majors. So if you had six major findings, you're high risk, or if you have one critical, then you become high risk. So once you've established the compliance risk for the site, determine, so let's, let's, let's pretend we've got a site that's got three major findings, so it's medium risk. That feeds then into this box here. So it has a medium risk as a compliance risk. Then you have to determine what is the what is the outcome from the previous bit here around the criticality and complexity of the site. So if we had it as a medium site, so that's so a medium risk and a medium risk is going to give you a risk rating of B. And then B says you should inspect between one to two years. So that's that's where it comes from a number of activities. So but what there may be is there may be other things that determine why that's there and based on the inspector's ability. And this is the bits here. So are there any recommendations to take into account on the next inspection? Or are there some things that actually have, have adjusted why this is there? But it's, as I say, so it's an outcome of the, the findings that were made versus what the, what are the particular challenges and complexities of that manufacturing site. Okay, let's go to the next one. Uh, there are multiple examples where US FDA has issued warning letter to a particular site, but the same site when inspected by EU or MHRA concludes the inspection with few or no observations at all. So how come, you know, inspections differ so much? Yeah, it's and, and, that, and that's an interesting one because I've been involved in some of those cases. And um, I think generally, I mean, so there are, lot, so there are lots of inspections where, um, for example, sometimes those inspections are done jointly when there's a problem. And there's, there's, there is good communication between the agencies on those issues. I think sometimes what can happen is that um, it can be the time difference between the inspections. I think you can sometimes find that some of the processes and the time it takes from perhaps having an inspection to there being a warning letter could be a period of time when that warning letter is there and, and perhaps there's another inspection conducted by a different agency. The site may have made corrective actions at that time. I think any any inspection is always a snapshot in time. But yeah, I mean, there are there are differences that are found, but I think equally there is as much harmonization and inspection findings being aligned. But I think the challenge the challenge for agencies is, and it's been a challenge on occasion, is when you have one regulator that says, actually, we've got some serious issues at this site and another regulator hasn't been able to establish that. That, that, that uh, I'll be honest that does cause that does cause agencies some difficulty and how does that get taken forward and there have been cases where actually one agency's then helped another to find that information to make a decision or there have been cases where a completely different outcome has been agreed between the US making one decision and perhaps Europe making another Okay, this is the one about uh, again the mutual recognition on which your presentation was there uh, though these agreements are there and there is a lot of effort going on to collaborate amongst different regulatory agencies uh, the result is not seen in the ground still you know especially if you look at in india different agencies are still inspecting the same company so a company would have inspection from uh, somebody from EU, MHRA, US FDA, and you know different different yeah. agencies that is still not seen. Yeah. So the so the way so the way and the way the system works is that and and, and let's take the the US EU MRA. So the MRA is about sites that are in Europe 
are then inspected by European agencies and accepted by the US, and sites in the US are inspected by oh. US FDA and accepted by Europe. There is there is the ability to exchange information on countries that are outside of those territories, and let's say, for example, in India. Now it does happen, but it's something that's not happened that much as of yet. Then on top of that, you've then got the PICS Reliance Initiative, which gives another framework that could be used to help with these processes. But again, that still sits more within where there isn't an MRA. So uh, what I think you'll find is that going forward, I think, you know, that any any agency is going to end up with more pressures, more pressures on its inspections that it's got going forward. So COVID has not only, obviously, you, they're struggling to do inspections now, it means they're going to have lots of inspections as a backlog to do when it comes to a time that travel can happen again, which could be quite a way away still. So a need, a need for agencies to work smarter and be more coordinated and actually discuss their inspection cycles to say, actually, We'll, we'll, we'll do this side, you do that side, I think is a conversation they need to have and we'll, we'll probably have to have going forward. But it, the, reason, the reason that despite the fact there's an MRA between the EU and the US, that's the reason that perhaps a site in India would still have an EU inspection and a US inspection because that isn't covered under the scope of the MRA. Uh, have the joint inspections really began anywhere? You know the FDA and the MHRA or FDA and EU doing joint inspections anyway. So there have been there have been some, but what happened? What I think you find is lots of lots of the joint inspections tend to occur when there has been an issue identified. So one one regulator has perhaps had you know a serious non-compliance found at a site that site supplies globally. And then rather than having that process of lots of agencies wanting to go there, sometimes there is a coordinated joint inspection by a number of agencies. I think I think there are more examples where regulators are starting to try to use joint inspections in, in, in a better way if there is a joint interest. But a lot of it still comes back to a need for um they're, they're resourcing and i think it often unfortunately it ends up as a bit of an afterthought i think sometimes so when it does happen it's generally driven by there being a non-compliance but i think you may find and, and it's another example where depending on the relationship that the eu has with the uk the fact the uk will have left the eu if there is some, if there is a working relationship, you may find there perhaps that um, you will have joint European and UK inspections. I, I'm just seeing, thinking how things may work out, but uh, as I say, that's very much dependent on uh, on the future working relationship as if that get agrees, if if anything gets agreed. Uh, you spoke about uh, remote inspections, and you spoke about also what would happen post uh, COVID. So can you give some projections? Will it continue the trend of remote inspections? Uh, you know, looking at the things which are happening in the regulatory agency even after post-COVID? I, I I suspect that in general there will be a in the main, I think there would be a desire by regulators to return to on-site inspections because <clears throat> whilst you whilst you do get a, an overview of a site. It isn't as robust as physically being there on site, trying to do things remotely. However, I think if you if you were to, and this is back to the whole thought process around risk and how regulators work, if you were to look at sites and say, actually, this site was really good last time we went there. It's you know it was our lowest risk site. We've said we'll go back in two to three years. You could perhaps say, actually, the next inspection will do remotely and then the inspection after that you might go back on site so you might perhaps start to blend for your highest quality sites those with the lowest risk that you could blend that i think you will find regulators 
having a bit bit more of a hybrid approach. For example, they may have documentation reviews off site and then as I say spend less time on site or they may only they may send less people to a site going forward backed up with people who can do that remotely. Now some of that comes from the benefits technology brings because but some of it will come from the experiences they have at this time in seeing how things work. So I think where where things can be used I think they will be but I but I think in the long run when the ability is there for people to go to site, I think actually to see the operations will, will be pref preferred by the regulators. This is about the risk rating what you spoke. Uh, why only number of observations are important to consider the risk to determine the reinspection frequency? Uh, shouldn't that also be based on how many cases or you know, what are the uh, cause of for potential system failure? Uh, sometime identified observations may not be significant. Uh, looking at, you know, what are the potential failures, then just looking at the observation. Wouldn't that also be important? Yeah, and, and I think some of that comes back to, so, and, and it is a bit of a blunt instrument, some of that, because you are saying, actually, here's the findings we had. <clears throat> but what some of it also comes back to is the, the ability for the inspectors to say, here's the other things that are going on at this site. Here's so, and how they, how those other risks get factored in. So I think if you've got a site that's particular, so it may have had a couple of issues, but in general it's well controlled, then you, that may be there. But I think if there are, if there are issues where you may have had, um, and a good example here would be, so say you had enough regulatory findings that it was a medium risk but actually there was other failings on the site or you could see things that were not going right. That's where you would either use, the inspector would have, would recommend the inspections done at a higher frequency. That's where it goes through more of a management review process as well to say, yes, we agree here, but here's your findings, but here's the other activities. And then I think that also comes back to the processes I talked about. So at MHRA with the compliance management approach, which is also being discussed and, and is looked being looked at across Europe to become a system. But how, where a site hasn't got critical findings and you're not taking regulatory action, but you're worried enough about the site that you want to put extra scrutiny on them and also try to influence them to become more compliant. So it's, so as I say, it's a bit of a blunt instrument just taking the findings, but you have to have something to try and Correct. give you an idea, but also doing it in a way that it's across all of PICS also enables countries to talk to each other, knowing that they've done the same risk assessment. Okay, now there are still several questions. We won't be able to take all of them. Our okay. time is getting. So we'll take this last question. This is a very interesting one. And especially people want to know because you know you were there with MHRA for such a long time, 16 years. Uh, what is your experience with Indian pharmaceutical industry about GMP compliance level? Any specific observations you yeah, notice? Uh, <laughs> and your message to the Indian pharma industry? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's interesting. That, that's, I mean, I've I've done a number of um, a number of presentations and roadshows in India, and you know, we, we we always talked about India being the pharmacy for the world and all of those sorts of things. And generally, the level of findings of non-compliance in India were not that different from anywhere else we went in the world, and, and domestically as well. So, kind of the 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 incident rates for India were not much different and I would say that you know I've and, and it's it's a slightly interesting one because when you when you go to look at firms in India those that are exporting are at the at the better end because you know they're, they're at the better end of the of the facility so you are seeing good facilities I would say the best the best facility I've ever inspected was in India so I mean that should be a that should be a good point for your audience and uh, and generally you've the real benefits India has is a fantastic level of education for staff. I, I don't think there's anywhere else I've inspected in the world where the level of science graduates working in a in a facility 
goes down that many layers of, of management and responsibility. And that's a real, real strong benefit for the for the Indian pharmaceutical industry. And um, I personally, I love going to India. It's always a pleasure when I when I go there. It's my favorite country to travel for work. OK, thank you. I think with this, we will come to the end of the webinar. Uh, so thank you very much, Mark, uh, for making this presentation a uh, very detailed one, uh, giving a lot of information. It takes a lot of efforts to present and then answer so many questions. Yeah, I, I would just say I hope, I hope you found it interesting and I hope it gave a an insight into something that isn't just kind of the, the usual straight technical presentation on on, on, a, on a topic and it actually helps understand how agencies and regulators work and Correct. why they work together and take those things forward. So I hope it was useful. And, and, and if you do have a question, look me up on LinkedIn or drop me an email, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, delegates. And thank you all for joining today. Have a good evening and see you. Uh, see you soon. Have a good weekend. Bye-bye. Fantastic. Have a nice evening all. Bye-bye.